Hello, and welcome to ASE's E3 webinar series. I'm Christina LaFuria, ASE's Vice President of Educational Activities. Today's webinar is entitled Structural Heart Mitral Valve Interventions. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items that I'd like to go through with you. Since this is a live webinar, you will have the opportunity to have your questions answered by today's speakers. To ask a question, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to ensure that all questions are answered. However, this may not be possible depending upon the number of questions submitted. A handout will be made available when the recorded webinar is posted. When the webinar ends, you will automatically be redirected to a new page to claim your CME credit. So don't log out of your browser. If you are unable to complete the test at this time, you will have 48 hours to do so. And we will send you an email tomorrow to remind you. And finally, if you experience any technical problems during the course of the webinar, please submit a message using the Q&A feature and I will try to address it as quickly as possible. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Lucy Safi, the chair of the E3SIG for today's webinar. Dr. Safi. Thank you so much. And I wanna welcome, welcome you all to the ASC E3 lecture series. My name is Lucy Safi, and I am Director of Interventional Echocardiography at Hackensack University Medical Center and Chair of the ASC Emerging Echo Enthusiasts, also known as E3 Special Interest Group. This special interest group provides an opportunity for early career physicians, sonographers, and trainees who are interested in echocardiography to present, interact, and discuss echocardiographic topics. Each lecture is formatted as a 30-minute didactic lecture followed by a panel discussion. On the panel will be two moderators and an expert in the field. During the discussion section, the panelists will also answer audience questions, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box below. This virtual lecture series will be recorded and later available online at the ASC E3 website. To join ASC E3, Log into your ASC account and under Update My Profile, click Specialty Interest Groups and then E3. Today's lecture is the second lecture in the E3 Structural Heart mini lecture series. The topic will be mitral valve interventions and joining me today as my co-moderator is Dr. Nadine Faza. Dr. Faza is Assistant Professor of Cardiology at Houston Methodist. She received her medical degree from the University of Jordan, completed her internal medicine residency at the Cleveland Clinic, cardiology fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine, and structural imaging fellowship at Houston Methodist. Welcome, Dr. Faza. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Our physician expert is Dr. Jayao Calavacante. Dr. Calavacante is director of cardiac MRI and structural heart uh, a structural CT, excuse me, at Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation. Dr. Calvacante received his medical degree in Brazil, completed his internal medicine and cardiology training at Henry Ford Hospital, and cardiovascular imaging fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. His passion is for multimodality imaging with research focused on valvular and structural heart disease. He has lectured and provided training opportunities both nationally and internationally on CT and MR. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Calvacante. Julius, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Payam Pornazari. Dr. Pornazari completed his residency and fellowship at the University of Calgary and is currently an advanced imaging fellow at the Houston Methodist. Welcome, Dr. Pornazari. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, the panel for having me to talk about uh, transcatheter mitral valve interventions. Uh, my name is Payam Bournazeri. I'm uh, currently doing my Structural Heart Disease Imaging Fellowship at Houston Methodist. I will, I will be talking about uh, transcatheter mitral valve interventions today. I do not have any disclosures. Uh, the learning objectives for my talk is to review the pre-procedure imaging findings needed to evaluate a patient prior to mitral valve intervention review required imaging needed for procedural guidance, and discuss follow-up imaging required for post-mitral valve intervention. Uh, Transcatheter mitral valve devices evolved quite dramatically over the past uh, couple of decades. Uh, on the left side of the panel, you see the transcatheter options for mitral valve repair. 
uh, including uh, the clips, uh, aneuplasty rings, and on the right side of the panel, you see uh, multiple transcatheter uh, valvular rep uh, replacement options currently under clinical trials. Uh, currently, the only FDA-approved device is the mitra clip, uh, as uh, you can see in uh, uh, picture A on the top uh, left of the picture. Um, so we have uh, multiple options. However, at this point, for uh, the purpose of my talk, I'm going to focus on two of them, which are the transcatheter edge to edge repair using the mitra clip device and also talk about uh, the valve in native valve uh, using uh, one of the clinical trial valve options at this point. So let's focus on transcatheter edge to edge repair. Uh, the two trials that uh, helped uh, developing the transcatheter edge to edge repair is the Everest 2 trial which was done in 2011 for primary mitral regurgitation, and then the COAP trial that was done in 2018 for secondary mitral regurgitation. Both trials showed safety and efficacy of the device. Everest 2 trial showed sustained clinical improvement as measured by quality of life, heart failure status, and left, uh, left ventricular uh, ejection fraction improvement and function, but did not show any improvement in mortality. However, the co-op trial, which was done for secondary mitral regurgitation, showed improvement in mortality, a reduction in hospitalization, and improvement in quality of life. Interestingly, in 2014, when the AHA uh, valve guidelines was published, there was no mention of transcatheter options for mitral valve uh, repair or replacement. And, uh, since then, in 2020, uh, the new and updated uh, AHA valve guideline was published. Uh, and uh, as you can see on the left side of the panel, uh, mitral valve uh, repair using transcatheter edge to edge repair is currently a 2A recommendation for patients with primary mitral regurgitation with high or prohibitive surgical risk. And in patients for secondary mitral regurgitation, uh, transcatheter edge to edge repair is considered a 2A recommendation for patients with favorable mitral valve anatomy, EF of 20 to 50 percent, LV and systolic diameter of less than 70, and a PA systolic pressure of less than 70 millimeters of mercury. This is all based on the co opt uh, trial data. Uh, for procedural planning for transcatheter edge to edge repair, we require a comprehensive transthoracic echocardiogram uh, to look at the mechanism uh, of the mitral regurgitation, uh, differentiate between primary versus secondary, uh, look at the anatomy, look at the calcification, as mitral valve has a complex structure. Um, uh, it is important to assess the mitral valve in great details uh, with respect to its anatomy. Uh, assess the severity and confirm the severity of mitral regurgitation and rule out potential contraindications that we will discuss in uh, a couple of slides. Uh, uh, for comprehensive trans esophageal echocardiogram, uh, again, it is required to confirm the diagnosis, uh, look at the mechanism and confirm the mechanism. Uh, have a better understanding of the anatomy and localization, uh, confirm the severity, uh, assess the feasibility of the uh, transcatheter edge to edge repair. And since again, uh, because mitral valve has a very complex structure, have a better understanding using 3D imaging. It is also crucial to understand the anatomy of the intratial septum and rule out contraindications. What are the contraindications uh, uh, proceeding uh, for a transcatheter edge to edge repair? Uh, presence of LA or left atrial appendage clot, uh, infective endocarditis, hypersensitivity to clip components such as nickel, titanium, cobalt, chromium, and polyester, or any sensitivity to contrast, the rheumatic mitral valve disease, or thrombus in the IVC or femoral veins. As I said, uh, mitral valve is a complex uh, structure. It is important to have a good understanding of the mitral valve anatomy, including the annulus, leaflets, cordae, 
And uh, 3D imaging is extremely helpful in understanding uh, mitral valve anatomy. Uh, it is important to obtain uh, a surgical on fast view of the mitral valve uh, when assessing uh, for transcatheter edge to edge repair. Having the aortic valve at 12 o'clock, the left atrial appendage at 9 o'clock, and the intraatrial septum medially at 3 o'clock. Just to emphasize the role of 3D imaging in uh, patients with unexplained mitral regurgitation, 3D imaging helped unmasking the presence of uh, mitral valve clefts. In a thousand, almost 1,100 patients with uh, moderate to severe mitral regurgitation, uh, 21 patients was diagnosed with mitral valve clefts using 3D imaging. So the initial evaluation for transcatheter edge to edge repair requires uh, a, a careful assessment of the mitral valve in 2D, uh, uh, assessing the anatomy and confirm that with color Doppler, you can uh, see a flail P3 with severe mitral regurgitation here. Uh, there is an eccentric jet uh, uh, that uh, goes with the, with the uh, confirmation of a diagnosis of flail P3. It is also important to differentiate between primary mitral regurgitation and secondary mitral regurgitation. The image on the left shows a flail P2, and the image on the right shows annular dilatation with restrictive posterior leaflet feathering. Uh, focal versus multi-scale uh, prolapse is also uh, important. Uh, uh, focal prolapse is more favorable uh, to be repaired with transcatheter edge to edge repair. However, multi scalar prolapse are more difficult, and uh, further evaluation and uh, character characterization of the valve is required. It is also important to have a careful assessment of the commissures, uh, a flail uh, commissural uh, regurgitation is uh, something that we cannot miss, and that makes the feasibility of the transcatheter edge to edge uh, repair more challenging. Uh, in order to assess the commissures, you require off-axis imaging. This case shows a flail uh, medial uh, commissural uh, uh, lesion, and uh, it is important that off-axis imaging is obtained in multiple views uh, to rule out uh, commissural defects. Uh, transcatheter edge to edge options are more challenging due to presence of cordae in uh, uh, segments one and three of the mitral valve. Another important factor is to uh, calculate the mitral valve area. Uh, prior to any uh, procedural planning. Um, uh, the ideal 3D planimetry is done with a TE, and uh, it has to be done at the leaflet tips uh, with proper orientation. Uh, our goal is to uh, have a valve area of more than four centimeters, square centimeters uh, before proceeding with transcatheter edge to edge repair. Uh, this table, which was uh, published in 2018 by Dr. El Sabaga and his group, uh, discussed the more favorable anatomy uh, for transcatheter edge to edge repair versus more challenging anatomies. As you can see, uh, A2, P2 segments with no calcification, uh, mitral valve area of more than four centimeters, and a gradient of, a gradient of less than four millimeters of mercury a flail width of less than 15 and a flail gap of less than 10 are favorable for transcatheter edge to edge repair. As we uh, move to medial or lateral uh, pathologies or a more complex severe barrel pathology, then the success and uh, chance of success with transcatheter edge to edge repair is uh, getting uh, smaller and smaller. Uh, what about secondary mitral regurgitation? Based on the co-op uh, study criteria, uh, we assess patients with three plus or four plus MR on maximally tolerated both directed medical therapy. Uh, patients, they have to be NYJ class two 
for uh, two um, class uh, four ambulatory EF of 20 to 50 percent LV and systolic diameter of less than 70 millimeters, uh, non commissural primary regurgitant jet, and a PA systolic pressure of less than 70 millimeters of mercury. There are multiple um, uh, clips uh, currently available in the mitral clip system. Uh, the NT and NTW clips are. Uh, are uh, smaller and the XT and XTW clips um, are larger. Uh, the choice of the clip selection is currently is based on the leaflet length and width of the jet, as we discussed in, uh, in later slides. In order to assess the uh, leaflet length, uh, the posterior leaflet has to be measured carefully in the grasping view, which is usually between 120 to 140 degrees, having the LVOT in view. Um, and in the setting of having a ruptured cordae or potentially presence of calcification, uh, you have to make sure that the cordae or calcium is not calculated in the leaflet measurement. The minimum leaflet length required for NT and NTW clips are six millimeters and uh, the minimum uh, leaflet length required for XT and XTW clips is nine millimeters. Uh, so let's move to procedural guidance. Uh, the procedural checklist is again to confirm uh, the anatomy and calculate the 3D area, uh, confirm the etiology and severity. Uh, uh, you have to bear in mind uh, that uh, the gradient can be high due to regurgitation, uh, so you have to take it with a grain of salt. It is also important to know that uh, sometimes in the setting of anesthesia and sedation, uh, patients' uh, degree of regurgitation can be miscalculated. Rule out LA clot and endocarditis, assess the intraatrial septum, assess the pulmonary veins, and try to get as many pulmonary veins as possible. Uh, you, you may have a uh, systolic flow valve salt in only one of them, uh, which uh, make or break the diagnosis. Assess the LVOT flow uh, using uh, the VTI from transgastric views, and always check for pericardial effusion at baseline and assess the uh, pericardial effusion on a regular basis. So uh, if the procedure is a go, then the first step of the procedure is a transeptal puncture. The transeptal puncture happens uh, ideally in the posterior and superior aspect of the septum in the fossa ovalis, uh, four to five centimeters from the mitral valve annulus. The ideal uh, length from uh, the mitral valve annulus and the height is 4.5 centimeters. Uh, the tenting of the intraatrial septum and uh, the puncture site can be confirmed and verified uh, by 3D imaging. And when a uh, transeptal puncture is made, then the, cath uh, the guide catheter is advanced uh, to uh, the left atrium. This is a case of um, uh, uh, prolapse uh, P2 with a flail cordae as can be seen uh, clearly on the left uh, image uh, with uh, a, an eccentric severe mitral regurgitation. Um, this was confirmed on 3D imaging. Uh, uh, look, uh, you can see the uh, severe uh, prolapse of the P2 uh, in the left image uh, and uh, uh, in the middle image, there's uh, a more uh, off axis uh, view and uh, with the mitral valve at the six o'clock instead of 12 o'clock to look at the image better and uh, the color flow in 3D. Uh, when um, the guide catheter is uh, advanced uh, to the left atrium, then we advance the clip delivery system over the guide catheter. Uh, TE imaging is done continuously to uh, make sure that the clip delivery system clears the Coumadin ridge uh, and then the clip does not advance to the pulmonary veins or the left atrial appendage. 
uh, the clip uh, and the guide are uh, both steerable, and so we make sure that the clip is oriented properly in the middle of the left atrium before any other maneuver is done. When the clip is in the middle of the left atrium, the clip is positioned perpendicularly to uh, the regurgitant jet and the pathology. And then the uh, leaflet arms, uh, uh, sorry, the clip arms and uh, the uh, grippers are uh, assessed uh, to make sure that they are working properly. Um, with proper orientation, the clip uh, system is advanced to the left ventricle. And then slowly, with uh, the, under the guidance of TEE, the, uh, the clip and the clip arms are pulled back, allowing for the mitral valve leaflets to lie uh, um, and rest in the in the clip arms. Uh, when this is confirmed, uh, then uh, the grasp uh, uh, can uh, uh, the interventionalist can proceed with the grasp, and uh, the leaflets uh, uh, are uh, are grabbed. Uh, under TE guidance. Uh, further assessment is done uh, with color Doppler to make sure that the grasp is accurate and there is reduction in mitral regurgitation. Uh, the grasp again is confirmed uh, with 3D imaging, uh, confirming a, a, a tissue bridge. You have to make sure the tissue bridge is stable and you can see a clear tissue bridge in A2, B2 uh, in this setting and the color uh, 3D imaging shows no mitral regurgitation in this setting. Uh, we also assess for hemodynamic improvement. Uh, uh, as you can see on the top left panel, there's systolic flow reversal uh, in the pulmonary veins, and in the bottom left panel, there is an upright uh, S-wave in the pulmonary veins. Uh, the LVOT stroke volume is improved in this setting, and we have increased LVOT flow, uh, which obtained from transgastric clips. After uh, the clip is in place, then there is a release checklist, uh, which requires confirmation of proper leaflet grasp. The proper leaflet grasp has to be uh, done in multiple views to make sure that the posterior and, and anterior leaflets of the mitral valve are stuck and tucked in properly in the leaflet, in the clip arms. And uh, it requires a complete integration with the color in various views as well. Uh, assessment of residual mitral regurgitation and uh, potential need for optimization. Checking the gradient on a regular basis to make sure that the gradient is less than five millimeters of mercury and also again, improve the hemodynamics, including the reduction in MR, looking at the pulmonary vein flow and the LVT gradient. Dr. Zogby and uh, uh, his group uh, published the guidelines for evaluation of valvular regurgitation after percutaneous valve repair or replacement in 2019. And uh, very important tips and uh, uh, points uh, were but outlined by, uh, by Dr. Zogby and his group. Um, so findings suggestive of mild residual mitral regurgitation, a significant reduction in color flow Doppler, significant reduction in vena contractile, which can be calculated by 3D assessment, improvement uh, in, or normalization of pulmonary vein flow, improvement uh, of the forward stroke volume, which um, in majority of the cases is associated with a, de uh, a reduction in LVEF and a new onset of a spontaneous contrast within LA or left atrial appendage. Um, I'm going to review a couple of cases. Uh, we discussed the case of primary mitral regurgitation. Now we're going to look at a case of secondary mitral regurgitation. This is a 65-year-old male with ischemic cardiomyopathy. His EF was 30 to 35 percent, and he was on maximally tolerated cold-directed medical therapy. His uh, echocardiogram and his TE showed severe mitral regurgitation, secondary to a tethered and restricted posterior leaflet and uh, annular dilatation. 
this was the assessment of his pulmonary veins. You can see an upright uh, S wave in left upper pulmonary vein. However, further assessment of the right upper pulmonary vein shows systolic flow reversal. Patient was uh, deemed to be a uh, good candidate for mitric clip, and he underwent uh, mitric clip implantation for transcatheter edge to edge repair. Uh, the, the first clip was uh, placed. Uh, which led to a reduction of the severity of mitral regurgitation to a mild to moderate category. His uh, post first clip assessment uh, showed a gradient of two millimeters of mercury, and therefore decision was made to proceed with uh, further uh, implantation of a second clip. Um, these are the uh, results of uh, implantation of a second clip lateral lateral to uh, previously implanted clip, which showed a significant reduction in the degree of mit mitral regurgitation, and his pulmonary vein assessment uh, showed a dominant S wave um, in, the, in the pulmonary veins. Transcatheter edge to edge repair can be used in patients uh, with uh, uh, mitral valve ring as well. Uh, this is a case of an 83-year-old uh, uh, male uh, that had uh, a prior mitral valve repair using um, an annuloplasty ring done, and he presented with heart failure symptoms, and he was found to have severe mitral regurgitation. You can see the ring uh, uh, on the top, uh, on, the, on the left uh, image, and uh, uh, if you uh, look carefully, you can appreciate uh, a flail segment uh, of the mitral valve uh, also uh, uh, coming off plane of the mitral valve. Uh, there is a regurgitant uh, uh, jet, which is very eccentric. And in a 3D view uh, assessment, um, uh, again, uh, the annual plastic ring is uh, uh, quite uh, noticeable. Uh, and a very eccentric severe mitral regurgitant jet is uh, identified. Uh, so patient underwent uh, uh, mitral clip uh, implantation uh, in the ring, and uh, this uh, resulted in um, complete resolution of um, uh, regurgitant jet uh, with uh, very good results. Hemodynamic assessment uh, initially showed uh, a blunted uh, S wave in the pulmonary vein, which uh, became completely normal after much of uh, clip implantation. And then the gradient across the valve was four millimeters of mercury with no regurgitation. Although uh, transcatheter edge to edge repair is considered a minimally invasive procedure, however, it uh, has its own complications. There are multiple complications that uh, needs to be uh, considered. Uh, right to left shunt uh, is, uh, is the most uh, uh, common one. Leaflet damage and cordial tear, mitral stenosis, a single, a single leaflet device uh, attachment or SLDA, uh, pericardial effusion and pericardial tamponade, which is required uh, uh, regular monitoring in the setting of hemodynamic compromise. Uh, this was a case uh, with severe tricuspid regurgitation and pulmonary hypertension, uh, uh, which after transcatheter uh, edge to edge uh, repair patient became hypoxic and in the setting of bidirectional shunt uh, required to have the shunt uh, closed with uh, an amplaster device. Uh, this is an example of single leaflet device uh, attachment. Uh, this patient uh, was uh, interestingly uh, completely asymptomatic. However, when he came for his uh, uh, post procedure of uh, echocardiogram, um, he was found to have severe mitral regurgitation and uh, subsequent uh, TE showed a single uh, leaflet device attachment. Potential solutions, uh, if anatomically feasible, is to attach, uh, is to attach additional uh, clip and to stabilize the uh, detached clip in this setting. Uh, for post-procedural uh, follow-up, 
again, guidelines uh, have uh, um, uh, a good table and clear recommendations. It is important uh, to characterize uh, and quantitate residual MR uh, post-procedure. It is also important to visualize of the microclips in post-procedure echocardiograms, and if required, get a chest X-ray or fluoroscopy. Uh, the guidelines um, uh, are uh, coming up with a few uh, parameters uh, to assess the post uh, transcatheter edge to edge repair mitral valve assessment. So, the mitral uh, valve assessment post uh, repair considered to be mild in these settings if you have a narrow jet uh, with a small uh, uh, and low velocity and a small vena contract out with no flow convergence a pulmonary venous flow that shows normal uh, systolic dominance, uh, having a, an A-wave inflow dominant, and an MR jet in the color uh, spectral Doppler with a faint uh, and parabolic shape. However, if the vena contracta is uh, getting larger, you have a potential flow convergence, which may or may not happen. Um, systolic flow reversal in the pulmonary veins, an E-wave dominant inflow uh, pattern, and a more dense uh, uh, spectral Doppler. These are all suggestive of moderate, at least moderate mitral regurgitation. Uh, don't forget that you cannot, uh, you, you can actually quantitate mitral regurgitation. One of the recommended ways is to calculate the stroke volume uh, by 2D and uh, deduct the stroke volume by LVOT, uh, VTI, and calculate the regurgitant volume and regurgitant fraction as recommended by the guidelines. I'm gonna quickly talk about transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Uh, different devices are being studied under various clinical trials. I will show an example of the intrepid uh, device used in initial feasibility study of the device. Uh, so, uh, this is a case of severe functional mitral regurgitation with uh, a depressed EF and annular dilatation. Um, so, different valves have different mechanisms of anchoring to the annulus. Intrepid uh, valve uh, relies on the radial force and other valves rely on annular or ventricular anchors, apical tethers or annular uh, docking rings. Uh, the initial approach uh, for, uh, for transcatheter mitral valve replacement using intrepid valve is transapical. Uh, you can see the uh, uh, finger poking that uh, happens at the apex, uh, and this is confirmed by the TE to uh, identify the true apex. And then uh, the valve is advanced uh, to the left atrium and gradually pull back under uh, TE uh, visualization. Uh, medial, lateral, posterior, and anterior brims are, uh, 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 they have to be in place before uh, valve complete uh, deployment. Uh, post deployment, uh, we assess for stability, positioning, and residual mitral regurgitation. And this is a 3D imaging of the uh, de uh, completely uh, deployed uh, intrepid valve with a gradient of two millimeters of mercury post deployment. Uh, so what is the Achilles heel of the TMVR? The Achilles heel of TMVR is LVOT obstruction by uh, displacement of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. Uh, CT plays a major role in uh, evaluating the neo-LVOT and the risk of LVOT obstruction uh, pre-TMVR. Uh, in summary, uh, echocardiography plays a key role in baseline assessment of mitral regurgitation in addition to pre-procedural planning, intra-procedural guidance, and uh, post-procedural follow-up. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, take any questions and I'll open it to the panel. Thank you, Dr. Pornazari. What a wonderful presentation and such great images and cases.
I wanted to open up our first question to our expert, Dr. Calavacante. You know that you are very experienced in CT, MR, and echo imaging. With all of the percutaneous uh, options on the market, uh, how do you select between TMVR and edge-to-edge and -edge repair? What are some of the echocardiographic findings that you look for or clinical findings? That's a great question for us to get started here. Nice presentation, Brian, for you know, a nice overview, uh, specifically for, for the edge-to-edge. Edge-to-edge is very safe and has a long track record of you know, establishing efficacy as well, right? And, and that bar has been set really high. And when you remember from a TCT a couple of years ago when the COAP trial got presented, you know, all the trials that we're doing with TMVR, they had to be redone and restructured because now they're going to compare not against surgery or medical therapy, but now with a clip uh, or Pascal or other devices. So selecting patients for repair versus um, replacement, still somewhat of an art. Um, you can, majority of times, and it becomes an evolving theme because now the clip that was done back in Coap or back in Everest for that matter, it's not the same clip that we use nowadays. Now we have G4. And so the capability to clip these patients now has expanded as well. So the field is completely evolving, you know, from small, leaflets that you cannot grasp before, then now you can grasp. Um, that leaflets that sometimes you require for, I remember, you know, during some of these primary markets, you needed to always put two clips because the force for, you know, uh, having single leaf device attachment, it was necessary. But now if you have a properly positioned XCW, you can do with one clip and have nice results. So uh, you can clip many more patients than you used to be able to do. Imaging has evolved to the communication, to the understanding, to push the boundaries, to repair patients that had even a surgical repair that has failed, that you showed a nice case. So it has really transformed the therapy in the field. So you should always start, can I repair? Who are the patients that would not be ideal? Well, those sometimes could be patients that have mitral calcification or some degree of mitral valve syndrome, combined mitral valve disease, in which you know, when you can repair, you can clip them, but you want to trade, you know, severe MAR tubes, you know, no significant MR, but some degree of mitral stenosis. Um, and so those patients are the ones that we will pause. Patients that you have calcification at the grasping site where you need to clip, you're not going to have a nice grasping. Um, patients that don't have enough posterior mitral valve leaflet, severe ischemic MR, significant annular dilation, large gaps, all those patients are the ones that you would, you can clip, but the results are gonna be suboptimal. And understanding too, that you don't want it to leave MR behind. What I mean by that is, you know, less than two plus should be the ideal. Others would say less than one plus, right Nadine? I mean, are you going to leave two plus? Is that acceptable? Um, I don't think surgeons would have stand um, you know, <laughs> behind us and to say that this is the standard of therapy by leaving two plus. Why would you be okay with that? So that's when TMVR replacement and replacement strategies will become really uh, the forefront. But how did you guys do there at Houston? But I, I absolutely agree with you. I think as the, as the field is evolving and we have newer uh, devices, larger sizes, we're able to tackle the more challenging cases and we're able to offer uh, more significant uh, MR reduction as compared to prior where we were limited by the valve sizes and things like that. And, um, and as you, you know, pointed out, if, if patients are able to be repaired with transcatheter edge to edge repair, this is the way to go, unless they have anatomical features that make it unlikely for them to have a successful repair and they'll end up with significant MR. Um, again, that's why the, the baseline evaluation and the Perioperative planning is important. It's important to do the 2D measurements. It's important to do the 3D imaging, look for clefts, look for calcifications, look at the posterior length, because you eventually wanna make sure that the patient goes into the procedure and comes out with significant reduction in mitral regurgitation. Mm -hmm. Now, nowadays, the, trans, the transcatheter mitral valve replacement devices are under trials, and you know some of them require transapical access, but I'm hopeful that 
as we do more, as we learn more, we'll be able to approach these um, with transeptal uh, approaches as many of the devices are, are, are being approached. And hopefully we'll be able to offer a wide range of therapies for patients with variable anatomical features. Um, and I know uh, Payam has pointed out that the Achilles heel of TMVR usually is LVOT obstruction. And uh, I wanted to ask you as, a, as an expert in multimodality, how do you approach these patients who are not anatomical candidates for transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair? And how do you evaluate the risk for developing LVOT obstruction? Yeah, no, this is a, a field that you definitely cannot just stop at the echo, right? We know that uh, for these patients, uh, cardiac CT and multiphasic, so integrating the whole cardiac cycle is the way for us to assess the risk of LVOT obstruction, which is actually multifactorial. So, and depending on the patient. So LVOT obstruction in patients that have prior surgical mitral valve replacement. So you're going to do a valve in valve, TMDR. The risk of LVOT obstruction is actually low. Why is that? Well, you don't have the anterior mitral valve leaflet, right? You have already a docking station. Now, it depends on also the valve that you're going to put inside, uh, meaning that if it is a poor scene or if there's a pericardial valve, that makes a, a difference. Even small millimeters might make a difference. Pericardial valves tend to have the leaflets going all the way to the end of the stent post, whereas poor scene valves, the leaflets are a little bit short and curled. And so you gain a little bit more space. It doesn't matter how much you atrialize. Visually, it might look better, but it doesn't matter. What it matters is the surgical leaflet is going to be displaced and is going to cover that space. And having a proper valve sizing and CT sizing, you should try to look at that new LVOT. Now, when to measure? Well, there are many nuances. It used to be that you're going to measure the end systole. Well, it turns out that the end systole, there's no much more blood to be ejected. So, much makes more sense probably to measure it sometime in the mid systole or integrate throughout the cardiac sac the early systole to the mid part. But don't go too conservative. Obviously, the field is evolving too in that CT field. It used to be that we're going to measure the end systole and we're going to say, oh, we cannot do it. It's you trying to understand this better, it might make more sense to probably integrate many more phases. Risk for LVOT obstruction is much higher in the presence of the anterior leaflet. So if you have a patient that had a prior surgical repair, that anterior leaflet, sometimes the posterior leaflet is going to be there. That anterior leaflet is going to be completely displaced. And even after you do the simulation um, and you have a nice new LVOT, what is nice? It's probably around 1.9, 1.8, 2.0, sometime around that ballpark, square of centimeters. Uh, even when you have a nice neural VOT, the behavior of that anterior leaflet sometimes is unpredictable. It might flick and it might flip towards the LVOT, sometimes it might flip towards the valve itself and impede the closure. Um, and so you have to be humble. Sometimes, um, you know, you look into is the anterior leaflet that long, 26, 27 millimeters. It's a concerning size of that anterior leaflet. Even sometimes going to be larger than to the diameter of the, the LVOT itself. So sometimes you might need to cut that into your leaflet, right? A uh, lampoon, which is, you know, a laceration of that leaflet to allow the splaying and then opening of that cell. The, the picture that you show, Payam, the Hyde Russell had that uh, called citral, which is a surgical resection, transatrial, surgical resection of the anterior leaflet and implantation of a sapien free with reinforcement. So that obviously assumes that the patient is somewhat of a you know, candidate for surgical intervention. Or modification of the, uh, the LVOT by alcohol septoblation, right? Which you can try to do that and it's much better to do it obviously understanding beforehand than trying to bail it out. So do preemptive alcohol septoblation, um, which can obviously be effective uh, in some patients. So there, there are many ways and you know, I would like to just put a quick plug here for the, the course that we uh, are running back in November 12 and 13th. Uh, I'll have a slide later here, but um, that we will be, again, having a one-to-one -one discussion, looking at the CTs for all those nuances. ECHO is quite important because it determines the mechanism and all these features, but you need the CT to be able to say, is this safe for us to move forward? That's an excellent point that you put up and, and, you know, it is unpredictable sometimes which direction, which direction that anterior leaflet would go. Um, 
I just wanted to remind the audience to go ahead and input any kind of questions that you may have in the Q&A box below, um, as opposed to the chat box. But we did have one question that came in um, that I would love to hear uh, the panelists' uh, opinion on. And, and, it, and it's uh, basically on, uh, based on the wide jets, so the wide mitral regurgitant um, jets, you know, should we use an NT or an XT? Um, do you go immediately for the, the wider clips, the Ws? You know, how does the width of the jet determine which clips that you use? Nadine, mm -hmm. I'll let you address that one since you are much more into the hybrid OR than I am. Sure. So um, again, the choice of the clip depends on the width of the jet and the length of the posterior leaflet. Another thing that we have to keep in mind is the mitral valve area. So if you have a mitral valve area that's less than four, you probably would want to go for a smaller clip because you you know the the mean mean gradient is prohibitive. That being said, a lot of times you can try with one clip and the gradient doesn't go up much. The you know. The gradient um, sometimes is, is driven by regurgitation, as Dr. Pornazeri pointed out. But if you usually have a large uh, valve size, a wide uh, jet, and a long enough posterior leaflet, you can start with a wide and bigger clip, the XTW, and then you can always reassess the degree of residual mitral regurgitation. Remember that, that you can reposition the, the clip. So once you place it and the residual jet is all, let's say, medial to the clip, you can move your clip medially to see if, if that will give you a better result. So you can always readjust, reorient the clip to get the best MR reduction. Your choice of the second clip does not necessarily have to be your choice of the first clip. So if you notice that the gradient is getting higher, the jet is narrower, then you can always put a smaller clip next to the bigger clip that you started with. And sometimes you go in with a plan and, and, and things happen and you put a big clip and the, the credit is prohibitive and it's not what you expected. Then you can just, you know, you don't release that clip. You go in with a smaller clip and reassess the degree of uh, residual mitral regurgitation. It, it's, um, it's, it's fun and it's very dynamic being um, in the cath lab and making all these decisions. And you have to talk to your uh, interventionalists and, and discuss the options and, and be ready to change course if the hemodynamics don't make sense. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think this communication dialogue, speaking the same language, understanding the procedural steps, it's what it makes so much fun to do it together. Um, this fine tuning that you mentioned is so critical, right? Uh, it goes back to that first point. Uh, you know, even small movements on, let's say, the XTW and the NTW can make a big difference on how much the MR will, will be. And you know, yes, you could leave it. Okay, we can put a second clip, but sometimes it's better to leave less material behind and be able to nail it than to try to, because the second one might not allow you to, you know, you don't have a lot of predictability of that mitral valve area, mitral grids, and then now we're going to be chasing your tail. Once you deploy, you're committed to it. So minor fine tuning might be so important uh, for the procedure list to recognize and also the image that you guide. Yeah. Absolutely, and also the, the new clips do allow you to um, reopen the clip arms. You can do just one side, you can, we can, we can yes. reopen both of them, and you can assess to see how much leaflet is actually inserted in the clip, which helps to determine whether or not you should deploy. You know, we do find that the bulkier clips, the XTWs, are harder to deploy in the commissures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're just too bulky. Um, and so, you know, going back to the original question, um, you know, are wider jets, is it better to put two clips or one? I think you have to kind of use that communication between your interventionalists and it's a case-to-case -case basis on which clip that you do use, assuming that there's no contraindication to one clip or the other. Um, yeah. And it's so important also to verify even before, because we, you know, sometimes we have the tendency to put the color doppler right after you know, when you have the leaflet setting and, and that kind of, you know, wing batting and um, that you see the grippers grasping into the leaflet, that's a great sign. You know, see how much leaflet reduction you were able to achieve before you put the collar. The collar can always verify that to make sure that you grasp leaflet. And when you're doing independent gripping uh, or grasping for that matter, that's when it, it is great, but sometimes avoid that pinwheeling. You don't want that clip to be you know, twisting, because that is instability, asking for trouble sometimes. So you want it to be completely perpendicular and being able to grasp and not put too much tension, torque into that clip. Um, respect the mitral valve. Yeah, interestingly, when you mentioned uh, the torque and tension, 
uh, we noticed in some of our cases that you know putting like larger clips um, actually cause um, like more tension yeah, and and it, it creates like it, it disturbs the geometry of the annulus um, and overall like the degree of regurgitation gets worse. Yeah, well, my colleague here, Paul Soraja, that's why he is really um, concerned sometimes. You know, you put a bigger one and, and you create that pin willing, right? That the, 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 the leaflet starts to, to twist and, you know, sometimes it goes more conservative into the next T, the next TW. Even though you can grasp more, it's better sometimes to put less or, in, you know, not too much yes. to attention to it. We got a great question from Dr. Bellini in the audience on uh, TMVR planning. Um, what has been your experience? You mentioned the lampoon procedure, um, you know, with the lampoon procedure versus the reverse lampoon. When should you lacerate from tip to base versus uh, base to tip? Now, that's a great question. And I guess, you know, a little bit more advanced. So lampoon, when the first developed was actually from the base of the leaflet into your leaflet to the tip. Um, now it has been modified and, you know, Jafar Khan and, you know, Robert Letterman and Adam Greenbaum, the, the, the trio trifecta there that have been really developing this and refining. Uh, they have been doing much more now from the tip of the leaflet to the base. And the reason is that it's much more reproducible and you cut much more. And particularly when you're trying to do this for patients with prime mitral valve repair, uh, that you explain that out that anterior leaflet uh, with the tip to base, then the base to leaflet. Um, obviously, when you do the lampoon, the other piece that you need to measure too, and you can do this by CT simulation, is what we call the skirt to new LVOT, skirt new LVOT area. Because why is that? Well, because when you lacerate that, then you're going to have the open cell of that sapient tree that you show. And what is that area that is going to be covered by the new LVOT by the skirt, the ceiling skirt? That's why you cannot atrialize too much the sapient tree because you need that ceiling skirt to seal into the mitral ring. And not, by the way, not every ring you can do valve in ring, right? Now it's FDA approved, but there are rings and rings. There are rings that are miscalled that they are actually bands. They're called rings. So it's a complete mess. But... You don't want, you want a ring that can become circular. You want a ring that is not rigid, that has some flexibility, that can adapt to that sapient tree. We don't have a TMVR specific for valve and rings, but now it's been FDA approved. So be mindful and careful with the rings. Tip to base, lacerates much more, cuts much more open. Um, and the experience has been better uh, that way as well. Um, yeah, there's a question on where you really see the the field going um, in terms of mitral valve intervention. You know, if there is a TMVR available, you know, should we be pivoting more towards that, or you know, really trying to focus on perfecting the edge-to-edge -edge procedure? Well, that's a loaded question. That could be a, <laughs> a talk for a seminar. Uh, as we talked about, uh, the bar has been set high, and because. Um, it is effective and keeps getting better. And you need a, a number, just like when you do the structural procedure, you need to do it well and you need to do it quick, you know, frequently to get well uh, and, and you get good results. Um, where is the place for TMDR? Um, so I would always say that, you know, there is a place for TMDR, particularly in those situations that we described before. Uh, also in situations that we recognize that they're not, not all FMRs are the same, right? Um, that there is atrial FMR and there's ventricular FMR. And within that ventricular FMR, there's a spectrum of disease as well, of the ventricle, right? Because the problem is the ventricle is not so much the valve. So understanding how much of that myopathy comes behind. Uh, I think the question alluded to, you know, granted that you can clip first, why not start with that? And then if it fails, can you bail it out with TMDR? No, that becomes a bit expensive of a, in a journey for the patient. Um, the, there have been a several cases done of, can you cut that bridge in case of SLDA or of residual MR? Can you put a TMDR device? Yes, they have been done. Uh, and uh, Paul was one of the first, Paul Suraja, 
the first one to kind of lacerate uh, with electrical cautery and cut that bridge and then put a tendine. Uh, the group from the NIH has also published that. Um, there is also industry within Abbott now developing a system that you can potentially remove that clip. So the field is evolving. And what I'm talking to 2021 now, it might not be the same in 2022. Um, but it is a very low bar. And, and I think, you know, we're talking about the mitral valve that you have two options. For the tricuspid, the clip is so effective too, provided that you catch in an early time that it does not make more sense to be waiting for this ventricle and this gap to continue to get so wide and wider. Um, so I, I think, you know, you could start with the strategy of the clip if it is possible, it always is safe. Now, the trials are always going to be willing to randomize these patients to TMVR versus clip. And, and I think that's what I would like to encourage you. Just because we can do clip, it doesn't mean that we should do it in everyone. There is a place for other therapies as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. And that leads us uh, to our next question, which is kind of around the, the same theme. And when you have a patient with mitral valve clefts, when do you consider um, pursuing edge to edge repair? Well, for edge to edge in the presence of cleft can be quite challenging, right? Because you are already, if this is a true cleft, and, and that's one of the other nuances, right? Looking at the 3D, <laughs> Uh, as we all know, one fast or those volume render reconstruction, sometimes it can be misleading. It can be a fold and not necessarily a true congenital cleft that mm -hmm. goes all the way to the annulus. But if you have a true cleft and if you have MR, um, is the MR just coming from that cleft or there's more MR because now the annulus is dilated? And by the way, there is a cleft, but there is much more MR the other way. You could tackle that other MR as well with the clip. Uh, but in the presence of a cleft in which the main mitral regurgitation judge comes from that, I would not potentially recommend this patient to receive a clip um, if that's all you have. Um, but I would like to hear the options and uh, the thoughts from both of you, Lucy and uh, Nadim as well. Yeah, certainly with the advent of 3D, um, we've been finding and diagnosing more of these um, clefts. And, you know, one of the tricks that you can do is obviously look in the surgical view, but also flip it around and look from the LV um, up into the mitral valve. And if you see the cleft there, then it's a true cleft. It's going straight through the leaflets. Whereas if it's not there, then it may be a fold. Um, and the folds are much easier to deal with. Uh, if it's a true clef, uh, cleft, what you can do is try to clip on either side of it. Um, or if there is one, um, one side of the cleft that has more regurgitation, as Dr. Calvacante mentioned, you can just go straight for the area of the most regurgitation. So it definitely adds challenge. If the annulus is dilated enough that you could put a clef, uh, clip on either side, that may be um, the easiest method. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think, and again, it depends on what options you have available in your institution. If you're able to screen such a patient for TMVR and they're good, candidates for TMVR, they can get into a trial. So that could be um, one way to do it. Um, if not, if for any reason they're not, or if that's not available, then you want to assess where the um, MR jet is coming from. It's If it's on the sides of the cleft, you can pursue clipping on, on one or either sides of, um, of the cleft. So we're reaching the end of our webinar. Um, the, the hour has, has flown by. We've had an excellent presentation and a uh, great discussion. I wanted to thank you all for uh, logging in and being with us today. I want to send a friendly reminder that the CME questions are, should be open or will open as soon as the lecture is completed. So don't forget to fill out your CME questions for CME credit. Uh, our E3 lecture series is every other Monday and our next one is on August I believe 24th on aortic valve intervention. So I highly encourage you, excuse me, August 23rd. I, ha I highly encourage all of you to join in on August 23rd for uh, aortic valve intervention. So thank you all again for joining in tonight. Thank you. Nice seeing everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye, nice. Bye.